Have you ever noticed that uh, as you live life, and I speak of the Christian life, and you live it in the presence of all manner of ups and downs, and bad times and good times, and mediocre times and whatever, that when you're happy, everything seems to be just happy all around you. But when you're sad, down and out, got problems of various descriptions, it seems like nothing goes right. <laughs> and yet, that's just because you're you and you're human. Never lose sight of your humanity. In this life, we will never be flawless like Jesus Christ. We're saved because of our faith in Him that He is flawless, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. And our faith in Him is built upon what the Bible says about Him and what He teaches us to do. And he knows that there are those ups and downs. I ask Gary to sing this song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Well, the Bible's full of material like that, and those who wrote songs, like we just sang, base those songs on the sentiments of the Bible dealing with the assurance faithful children of God have. In writing the Colossians, the Apostle Paul said to those brethren of 2,000 years ago, For I know that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. Colossians 2, verse 1. I have for you. Paul had that conflict in him as an apostle of Christ. And his care and concern that members of the church would be faithful. I have for you. Personal thing. And... For them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. I think that covers us. That their hearts might be comforted. Being knit together in love. And unto all riches of the. Here it is. The full assurance of understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. And of the Father and of Christ. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And notice he has their concern when he writes all this because he said in verse 4, This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And then in verse 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, what are those words to accomplish in you and me as members of the church? And I speak primarily this afternoon concerning being faithful in Christ. Whether well, designed to assure us that what we have believed and what upholds us is true. Have you ever had somebody over a certain matter assure you of certain things? Give you words of edification and encouragement? Have you ever, when your children were sick or hurt or maybe just had their feelings hurt or whatever, and you picked them up, especially their small, of course, and you gave them assurance, you comforted them. Mama still loves you. Daddy's here. Why do you say those words? What, what meaning are they to a child? Well, they're designed to give assurance. You haven't been forsaken. When Jesus said to the apostles, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It was designed to assure them, to comfort them, to cause them to keep on keeping on in the way that is right, the straight and narrow way. I think if you study your New Testament, you see there are a great many sentiments expressed designed to assure us and to strengthen us by that assurance. And of course, none of it works except that we know the book. And we're all striving to live by the Word of God. John did this in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. 1 John 3, 19. And notice how he does it. Look at the solidity here. Look at the solid foundation giving them assurance. And hereby we know that we are of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before Him. Now here's what happens sometimes. For if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. 
And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Then the last verse of the chapter. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. Again, another passage like we read in Colossians, designed to assure us that what we have believed and most surely know from the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't changed. So when you're down, when you're up, when you're physically ill, or when you're feeling good health-wise, when you got this problem or that problem, it doesn't change God, nor his love for us, nor his word, nor the promises in his word that I'll be with you always. It's simply what we must experience in the flesh because we're human. And all around us is every kind of sin under the sun. And even in the church, people get to the point where they're like Ananias and Sapphira or they're like Demas. So we must not let these outside activities bring us low because they do from time to time. If I could go back over, you'd be miserable to listen to it, but if I could go back over it all the years of my preaching, how many times, as uh, my grandmother used to say that I was so down and out, uh, my chin was hanging so low I could uh, drink buttermilk out of a churn. Uh, that may not mean anything to some people, if you know what a churn is. I guess you know what buttermilk is. <laughs> but anyway, that means you're down. <laughs> Have you ever said, you know, I just got the blues today? What does that mean? Well, it means you just don't. You just like to fade off into the sunset. You think you're different from other people who are trying to live like the Bible says? Satan's going to see to it that you have those kinds of days. That's his work. That's all he does. He does it 24 hours a day, the best anybody can ever do it because he's the author of all of it. And all he wants to do is get us to doubt God. He wants to get us to doubt his word. He wants to get us to doubt our service to God. Oh, woe is me. So we all have insecure and uncertain moments in our lives. We're going to continue to. Sometimes more so than others. Sometimes, in other words, the confidence is just not there. And we need time for ourselves. You know, I hear all of this about uh, married people making sure they don't lose out on the romance. They have one another and raise their children, their jobs and all this stuff. So I have date night. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Well, it's trying to renew what started back there before you knew the vicissitudes of life and the ups and downs and whatever. And you're trying to keep that, quote, spark alive. Well, don't you know that in as members of the church, children of God, human beings in the flesh, simply because your sins are forgiven and you're on the way to heaven because you are determined to live like the New Testament says, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You're not going to let anything get under your skin. Well, there's one thing that will get under all our skins, manner of speaking, of course, and that is you feel down and out. Your confidence just sort of wanes, and you say, what's the use? What's the use? Have you ever said that? Well, of course we have. The only way you could say you haven't is to admit you're not a human being, maybe some kind of zombie. And, you know, I heard this thing the other day said, I guess uh, a person in a zombie world can feel bad since zombies eat brains and all the zombies pass you by. So, so there's always something to feel, feel, make somebody feel despondent. I'm not even worth the attention of a zombie. Well, I can't think of a better thing for Satan to use to get you to lose confidence in God and the gospel, the Bible, the way of doing things. So we have to just simply be determined to be assured by the truth of God because that has not changed. It hasn't changed. So don't feel unworthy. Don't feel ineffective. Don't feel guilty. Feel guilty if you know you've transgressed God's will. That's another story. But you can take care of that and get rid of that pretty quick. Just repent of that after recognizing it. Pray God for forgiveness. Pick up and keep on. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Satan getting you to feel guilty when there's nothing to feel guilty about. That's sort of like what FDR said when he, when he became president, we have nothing but fear but fear itself. Well, that's a pretty good statement. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, a lot of times we have nothing to feel guilty about but 
being guilty. <laughs> what makes me feel guilty? Ask yourself that question. Guilty says the proof's in and you've been found guilty. Well, is it? Have you transgressed God's will? Have you violated His will? Have you not sought forgiveness? Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that feeling of misery and gloom and oh, woe is me that comes because of privation and problems. So this could be a tool of Satan. It's a great tool of Satan. He'll convince you that really, do you really have hope in Christ? Maybe you don't. So he uses it as a tool effectively to cause you to give up. And I've seen a lot of people over the years who have just given up. They've let the affairs of this present world and the way brethren act in the church just say, what's the use? Now, who's the author of that? Certainly not God. Does God want you to give up when everything in the Bible says stick with it? Be thou faithful, even if you must die. Be faithful. And then what? I'll give you a kind of lie. Satan says, oh, you don't do that. Too much, too much to go on. But we have blessed assurance based upon the great favor of God that extends His mercy to us through the great gospel of Jesus Christ. We have favor with God. We have assurance of God as we stand before Him. We are, as children of God, the beloved of God. He knows how to get us from earth to heaven. And that's all He's interested in. He knows how to get us from earth to heaven. And He knows the kind of beings we are, and He knows what we've got to face. We also must realize we have assurance because of our work for God. That gets back into 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, look at the assurance. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We all need encouragement from time to time. And John and Paul in these passages we read gives to us what we need. Now regarding what John said, we need assurance to stand. It's easy to, easy to stand when there's no opposition. That's so easy. It's hard to stand when there's opposition. But we need to then, therefore, know we are standing before God Almighty, who's our Heavenly Father, and wants us to be saved. The image presented here is like that of a courtroom. The accused stands before the judge. Well, that's not too comforting a situation if you've ever been in court not because you're accused some of us served on juries we've seen the accused we sit through trials and seen what happens but who is our accuser I'm speaking of faithful children of God who is our accuser Satan he doesn't want us to place any trust in God can you really believe what God says how do you know that's right all you got to remember is how he approached Eve all he did was get Eve to doubt the Word of God. There it is. That's all he did. That's all he did was get Eve to doubt God's Word. Hath God said. I've said in many classes in college where people are trying to change the students from fundamental matters on God and the Bible, and they just ask questions. Create doubt. You don't have much assurance where there's doubt. You just don't. So he accuses us before God, making accusations against our morality, our character, our, our own faith in God. Is it really what it ought to be? Uh, our obedience. Are we as obedient as we ought to be? And he makes us begin to second-guess ourselves. He accuses us before ourselves even. One of the hardest things to do when you know the truth of God regarding salvation, you know when God forgives you because you read his word and you understand it, and then when you obey the gospel and you do those things from the heart that God says is necessary for one to be forgiven of God, and then you still feel haunted. You know why? It's hard to forgive yourself. A lot of people are plagued with lack of faith in the divine system that God has ordained, the gospel system, and we don't forgive ourselves. That's a lack of faith in God that when He said He would forgive you and you've done from the heart what He said, you must forgive yourself. I wouldn't recommend trying to forgive yourself when you know you haven't done what God said to do. That just won't work. That's bad news. It just does not work out that way. 
If we quit because of things like this, then Satan wins. God's the judge before whom we stand, and his view of us is what really matters when all is said and done. But he saved us as human beings with all of our human frailties. You may have as great a faith built on it, thus saith the Lord, as, as, as a person possibly could have. It will not remove all doubt. It should not create doubt, and the truth never does. But it's us. We're weak, and we're needy. That's the reason that we must spend much time in prayer and meditation on His Word and constantly be willing to see our faults. That's why Paul said his strength is made perfect in weakness. It's dependence on him, which means depending on his word, which means depending on your knowledge of it and your submission to it. Now, our judge knows we need encouragement. We've read a couple of passages, and there are many others like that. We have examples from the Old Testament where people had to be encouraged in doing what was right. Intellectually, they knew what was right. Intellectually, they knew God existed. Intellectually, they knew the requirements of God. But there's that human element. I think courtrooms are scary places when you consider yourself being tried for something. <laughs> and that may mean all sorts of things happening. I think, again, I say we've been on, some of us have, on jury duty, and, and we know that having set through trials and you know what can happen with you and me and it does is our own hearts our inward man if you please can be very cruel to each one of us and be very condemning because of Satan's efforts to create doubt in you in the word you intellectually know and admit to be God's word you see it again back in that first sin by Eve being deceived, by believing a lie and obeying it and sinning. Didn't she know what God said? She did. She quoted back to Satan what God said. Well, then why did she do what she did? Because there's that human element. So God assures us in the truth of the gospel, as we stand before him, that he's not stopped loving us. He hasn't stopped saying, I want you in heaven with me, and that I'm doing all that's possible to save a free moral agent in this world. It's all out there. It doesn't change, regardless of how I feel about it. I have to remind myself of that, and I have all these years. It still doesn't mean it doesn't get me down. It does very much sometimes. But you keep on keeping on. When you feel miserable, just keep on keeping on. And you will feel miserable. Anybody says that they serve God faithfully all these years, well, I've never felt miserable. I've always been upbeat. I've never been discouraged. I never need anybody to encourage me. Well, then why are you in this worship? If we all laud, laud and worship God together, it's designed to encourage you. What do you have in Hebrews 10, 24? That we're to provoke one another unto love and good works. You mean I actually provoke you? Yeah. I can provoke you the wrong way. But I can provoke you to love and good works. And you do that by preaching the word. You do that by doing things that God enjoins upon us to do them. So even our worship, although it's directed to God, we benefit from it individually because of the assurance uh, that it offers us. And so we sing a song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Well, why is that in there? What do you mean by that? What did that do for you? What did that say to the person sitting around you? Designed to assure. Keep on keeping on. Don't give up. I don't care how you feel. Sometimes you just will go out and scream. Or as brother, <laughs> as brother Wallace used to say, much you want to take a file, gnaw on it, and flee into the wilderness. <laughs> well, it's times like that. We're sure that Jesus is greater than our sin. I cannot commit a sin that's bigger than God. Let that sink in. Does that mean, therefore, I want to go about sinning? No, it just means that as I, from a proper attitude toward God and His Word, am continuing on, that He's ready to forgive. Now, there's a lot of folks done some very terrible, horrific things in their lives. But God can forgive every one of them when we have an attitude of the mind that says, I trust in God based on His Word and I will comply with His will and nothing will separate me from the love of God if I do that. 
None of these sins are greater than God's grace, His favor, and His mercy. You know, uh, mercy means I am guilty. I don't want what justice says that I should get. I want your mercy for the sins I committed against you. So we have in the gospel system God's mercy extended to us. As sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So we can have this. And in Christ, the system doesn't change. That is, the system Satan uses. Because he's going to make you doubt if you're worth anything. It's going to make you doubt if anybody cares. It's going to make you say, well, does anybody care? Does anybody want things to be as God wants them? And if you look at all the Demases in this world, remember Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. If you look at all that kind of people, the Ananias and Sapphira, all those folks, and that's all you look at, you're going to get discouraged. You'll lose the assurance the Bible offers you. You can't do that. They may make you feel down and out one day, but I always think of sort of like the sort of like the old 24-hour stomach bug. It's 24 hours, it's a bug, and it'll pass. Do you feel good about what's happening? No. Physically, you don't. You feel terribly miserable. Well, what about mentally and spiritually? Can you ever get down that way? Can you ever feel miserable? I do. I certainly do. There's something wrong if you don't. In fact, I don't think anybody can live faithful to God and not at times, as I said earlier, get down. If you think about Christ and who he died for, he died for all men, but think of the different kinds of all men there are and how rank and terrible some of them are. Those in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost had just 50 days prior cried out concerning Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. There they are. Many of those same people, because of the gospel system of salvation, were crying out because they were pricked in their heart by the truth. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Christ even died for those who were involved in his actual physical crucifixion, those who drove the nails into his flesh. And one of them in his death pierced his side with a sword. And they sat down at the foot of the cross and cast lots to see who got his, his mantle, which it was ro woven only in one complete seam, and they didn't mind doing what they did to Jesus, but they didn't want to tear that thing up. He was dying for them. Of course, he saved the thief on the cross, the thief evidencing that he wanted to be saved. The only sin that's not forgiven is the one from which we refuse to repent. So the reason I started out as I did, uh, you can be determined to do right as the Bible defines the right, Satan still make you think because you're imperfect that you haven't got any hope in this. But when you recognize what the sin is, you've transgressed God's law some way, then you can repent of it. Totally determined from the heart you're not going to do it anymore. Or you're going to start doing what you ought to be doing and pray God for forgiveness. God says you're forgiven. Our lives stand on trial before God. And the best way in the world to get forgiveness and peace of mind is to say, Father, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I did what I did because I liked it even when I knew it was contrary to your will, or I didn't know in my ignorance, but I was enjoying what I was doing, and I learned later it was contrary to your will, and I must acknowledge that. But a whole lot of folks, when confronted with the truth that condemns actions in their lives, they won't. They'll try to defend themselves. And that's a good example of that is old King Saul because that's what he tried to do. Here's what's wonderful about God, and I'm speaking again to Christians here, as you feel down and out and up and whatever and need assurance. God is always declaring our innocence before the great accuser who is Satan because of the blood of Christ which was applied to us and we were buried with our Lord in baptism and continues to apply to us as we struggle through life. That's what is meant in verse John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When you think of the apostles and how they wrote those words of comfort to brethren, and yet many of them wrote it while they were undergoing severe persecution for the cause of Christ. 
Okay, we must be beloved of God. We are beloved by God. If you're a child of God, you're beloved of God. I don't think we understand that like we ought to. John calls us beloved in this passage. He's speaking of his love for us, God's love for us. But he does not love anyone that does not share God's love with him. We're God's beloved, according to John, when we keep his commandments. There's no ruling that out. Jesus said to his apostles, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. This is the time when your heart will not condemn you. That's the reason I said at the beginning, when you feel like you're guilty and you look at your life in the light of the truth and you know that you are, you can remedy that immediately. But I'm speaking primarily to members of the church because of all the ordeals that we go through in life we're caused to doubt. But yet we can't find anything wherein we in mind or action have violated the Lord's will. Then why do we doubt? We shouldn't. But we have to recognize that can happen and Satan uses it to get us to doubt. This is the time when your heart will not condemn you it's when you do God's will and when you realize as a human being there are always those frailties that if you let Satan use them, he'll make you think you're a sinner when you're not. To avoid that guilty conscience, we must simply obey God. You will never get around that. John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love. Well, why is that the case before we read the rest of the verse? Because love always leads you to obey God's will. The love principle never rises higher nor sets aside the authority principle. The love principle always leads one to submit to the will of heaven as it is in the word of God. So there's no fear in love. Why? Because love leads you to comply with the Lord's will. Love leads you to evaluate your life in the light of truth, and you know you're on his side or not. You know you're doing his will or not. Notice, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. John wrote that to assure us. He's saying, be fair with yourself, be objective with yourself, and your evaluation of yourself. Satan is going to do all he can to make you feel worthless. And he does it through human instrumentality. That's where it always works. Satan doesn't work in this, in this life to impact us like the flu drifting around through the air. Satan works through his agents. So his agents, human agents, will make you feel bad. I think there are some people whose lot in life and they get joy out of making people feel bad. Whether they need to feel bad or not. If you're a sinner, feel bad. But you can do something about it, can't you? But if you're living like the Bible says, why have a guilty conscience? But Satan's henchmen will work on you that way. They'll make all sorts of charges against you. They'll make all sorts of whatever's against you to make you feel bad. Well, we need not fear punishment for crimes we did not commit, regardless of Satan's empty accusations. There's no need to feel condemned when you're living righteously. When we obey him, we actually please God, and he will not destroy us for that. He's bigger than our doubts. So objectively, do you know you're on God's side? If you're on God's side, you're keeping His commandments. So why should you feel bad? How do you know what to rejoice in? Paul said rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in what? In knowing you're doing God's will and heaven's your home when you die. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. The commandment in particular is what? Well, we believe with all our heart that Jesus is God's Son. And second, we love one another, as the Bible teaches that love one for another. And here are a lot of people, I've said it over years and years, their concept of love is you let brethren just go along and sin and never cause any problems. That's not love. Jesus never did that. Love always leads one to point the way to God, whatever that person must confront in his life. So belief also involves obedience. Remember what James said in James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Faith means doing what God has told us to do. Love demands humility, understanding the needs of others as equal to yours. Now, there are a lot of folks don't want you to see that. We must demonstrate genuine love for others as Christians, following the example Jesus set for us. Remember in John chapter 13, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples to show 
who would be greatest in the kingdom. And yet, uh, look at some of those disciples at that time, what they were going to do shortly thereafter regarding Christ. He healed many sick and fed many hungry people to show his love and concern for those less blessed than him and others. He went to the cross to show just how much love he has for us. So when we're called on to suffer, then are we suffering for righteousness' sake? If so, we're right. The Lord said, take up your cross daily and follow him. When asked how much he loved us, Jesus simply stretched out his hands on the cross and said, by that gesture, by being nailed to the cross, I love you this much. Suffering goes along with salvation. Thus Jesus exemplified the love that we must have one for another. Then we will not fear God's punishment. We will not fear also Satan's accusations. Blessed assurance is given to us because of our work. We've already touched on this some. Lives of love and dedicated service and effort. That's what it's all about. Lives of love and dedicated service and effort. Now this doesn't earn our assurance. It's the gift of God's favor that we learn through the gospel system. That's why Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thus we often say, like 1 Corinthians 15, 58 teaches, well, you know, just keep on keeping on. You know what's right. You know what the Bible says. You know what's involved in faithful Christian living from day to day. Prayer, Bible study, ready unto every good work, opposing error, upholding the good, seeking those that you might find a way to save them and teaching them the truth. The assurance that we're talking about depends on all of this. We're assured because we keep his commandments and we please him. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 12, verse 15 wrote, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. I hate to say it, but we're around a lot of fools. And they try to make us, who love the truth and abide by it, feel like we're sorry as dirt with apologies to the dirt. To do things your own way may seem best, and it does to a host of people. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But in reality, according to the Bible, this is a foolish attitude and venture. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 makes it clear. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. What's the wisest choice as to choosing the course of action? Obey God. From the heart, obey Him. Obey Him because you love Him. He's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can sustain you. Because it brings about God's assurance that Satan's accusations will not be heard in God's court. Satan can stand up and accuse us all day long, as it were, at the judgment. He won't do any good. We're covered by the blood of the Lamb as long as we're faithful. When you go your own way, Satan's accusations are true. You're trying to get to heaven on your own think so. But you get to heaven on the authority of the Lord doing what he said. So you must operate that way. You must train your mind. All right, is that going to remove all doubt and all times? You're, in other words, you'll never have another downtime? No. No, I expect to have a number of downtimes. But you know what I also expect? I expect to have some get-up times. <laughs> if you ever rode horses, you know, you say to the horse, get up. You do that because you want to go. <laughs> now, are you assured of your faith? Let's so live that Satan's accusations are lies so that we can have God's assurance in our hearts. First, remember you stand before God who loves you and gave his son to die for you and want you in heaven with him, not before Satan. Remember that you are one of God's beloved. You have assurance because of your faithful life. That's what John's writing about. Live so that his blessed assurance will rest securely on your heart and you can ignore the tugs and traps of Satan's false accusations. And when you go out sometime and scream at the moon because you can't stand anymore, then just let the old uh, steam off. 
and then back up and just put your shoulder to the grindstone and keep grinding. <laughs> That's what's meant in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in the Lord. It's not in vain in the Lord. There's no other way around it. There's no waving of a magic wand. I asked a doctor not long ago. I said, well, now you're a doctor. I said, uh, is there some magic wand you can wave, maybe lose 60 pounds before I leave the office? Well, there's not. And there's not any way to heaven and being faithful except that you go through whatever's necessary to get the job done. Now, the Lord knows that. And he's with us through thick and thin. Even when we're down and out, he doesn't depart from us. Even when we feel like the whole world's left us and our best friends and family's gone against us, if we know objectively we're doing his will, he hasn't left us. If objectively we see error in our lives, why, he tells us to repent of it. And he's still with us. And he'll see us all the way. If you're not a child of God, we have studied what to do to become a Christian. We think most here are. Believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being buried with the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. Now, as a child of God, are you despondent? Have you forgotten your first love? Have you forgotten God loves you? Have you forgotten that if you're steadfast and unmovable, nothing's in vain? Well, bolster yourself up because there are more days like that coming. Because all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution of one kind or another to one extent or the other. Well, that was all written 2,000 years ago by God for us and our benefit. So, when you leave this afternoon from this building, you ought to leave fully reconciled to God. If there's any sin in your life as a child of God, you ought to repent of it, pray God for forgiveness, having confessed it. But leave here with full assurance of faith. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washing His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That'll get you through. You may feel miserable sometimes, but just like that old virus, when you were bowing down before the white throne in your bathroom, the next day you'll be better. Even this shall pass away. If you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.